We've been working through the book of Luke over these last few weeks and months leading up to Easter, and today we have a pretty sizable chunk of Luke to read, and so we're actually going to break it up into a couple of bits, and I'm going to read uh, the first part now, and Bob Wood will come and read uh, the second part in a little while. So, Casey, if you can put up that reading for us. So it comes from Luke chapter 18, and I'm commencing to read at verse 31. Jesus took the twelve aside, that's his twelve disciples, and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be turned over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him and kill him. But on the third day he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. We continue our Bible reading from uh, verse 35 of chapter 18 of Luke's Gospel. As Jesus approached Jerusalem, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who, led the way rebuked, those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Jesus entered Jerusalem and was past Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten miners. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your miner has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your miner has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came to him and said, Sir, here is your miner. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. 
I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, Take his miner away from him and give it to the one who has ten miners. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. This is the word of our Lord. Well, welcome everybody, all our regulars here and any guests who might be amongst us, you're very welcome. And we're glad that you're here and we're glad to be here too. And before I bring the sermon, please just join me in a brief prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, last time that I preached here, uh, which was back in the middle of February, in our series from the book of Luke, Jesus had just commenced his lengthy journey from Nazareth in the north, uh, finishing his Galilean ministry up there, going south, going up in elevation to Jerusalem. And for the uh, good many chapters in between, we've had this uh, long and winding path to Jerusalem. Jesus has done many things and taught many things on this path as he's heading for Jerusalem. So last time I preached, he was just beginning this journey. Now he's just on the verge of going into Jerusalem. Not quite there yet, but these are the last things before uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Next week, he will be in Jerusalem, but you'll have to wait until the sermon next week to hear what becomes of that. Remember, I began last time with Jesus setting out resolutely. He set his face, literally, to go to Jerusalem. He was determined to go there and now he's almost there. Today we'll consider the final incidents on this journey. First thing from our reading is puzzling. So let's look together at um, Luke chapter 18 uh, and verse uh, 31 to 34. Um, And it is quite, quite a puzzle at first. Tells us there that Jesus took the 12, that is the 12 apostles of his disciples, aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem. And he said this before. And everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them and they did not know what he was talking about. Now that's the real puzzle. These disciples we're talking about are the 12 apostles, Peter, James and John and the rest, uh, the 12 mentioned back there in verse 31. Uh, They'd been specially chosen by Jesus at the beginning of his public ministry. They'd been with him almost full time for anything from one to three years. Throughout his public ministry, they'd heard everything that he'd said over and over. They'd witnessed many, many miracles of all sorts. They'd been with him constantly. They'd heard all his teaching as well. You'd think that more than anyone else, they'd know what Jesus was on about. Well, what is it that they did not understand? And see how this is really emphasised in that text. The prophets that it mentioned there, um, it said every, Jesus said that everything written by the prophets, that was all the prophets of the Old Testament, and they were read 
regularly to them. Whenever they went to services like this at their synagogue, except it was on Saturday, they'd hear these prophets uh, systematically going through them all and they'd hear what the prophets had to say. So they were familiar with the prophets. Um, and uh, they, all, all the Jewish boys who went to school, that's the prime thing that they heard, the, the Old Testament scriptures. Um, so once again, they should have known what Jesus was about. All the faithful Jews in their homes and in their villages talked about these things too. The son of man that Jesus mentioned is himself. It's his regular way of, of self-reference. Um, and the Gentiles, uh, the non-Jewish people, particularly the Romans who were in charge at that time and, um, and um, ran the place. Jesus said that everything that the prophets of long ago wrote about himself was about to be fulfilled. And that involved being held captive, subjected to the Romans, mocked, insulted, spat at, flogged and killed. And then on the third day, he will rise again, he said. That's a terrible message, I'm sure you'd agree. But is there anything hard to understand in those words? Are there any difficult words there? Are there convoluted sentences that they would have trouble working out what the meaning was? No, it's all very straightforward, isn't it? It's plain. Um, so why didn't they understand? Now the puzzle is compounded when we realise that this is not the first time that Jesus had said such things to them. In fact, the first time was back in Galilee before he commenced this journey to Jerusalem. And we read of that in Luke chapter 9, verse 22, which I'll quote to you. This is the very first time. Um, Luke 9, sorry, uh, Luke, Luke 9, 22, uh, we read that uh, he said to them all, this is just after Peter had confessed that Jesus was the Christ, that's the turning point. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. He's beginning to talk about the cross. And then um, he, in, in uh, chapter 9, verse 51, um, he, that's when he's heading up to Jerusalem. Um, I'm sorry, I've just got the wrong bit here. Um, it's in chapter 9 and verse 22. Sorry, that, I did have the right verse and I've looked at the wrong spot. Jesus, Peter said, you are the Christ of God. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone and he said, this is the very first time, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. That was the very first time. In fact, we do read that Jesus said he spoke this plainly to them. It uses that word plainly. And that it was on this occasion that he began to teach them these things. So it was a repeated thing from here on. The reaction the first time was dramatic, to say the least. Peter took Jesus aside, we read, and began to rebuke him. Just fancy that. Peter rebuking his Lord. Peter said, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. No doubt Peter, the leader, voiced the thoughts of all the twelve, but it did have to happen, just as Jesus had said, just as the prophets had predicted long ago, and it did happen. And Peter and the others had to painfully learn the truth about Jesus and what God was doing through Jesus and how it was for their sake. Now, the next time that Jesus told this terrible message to the twelve was quite soon after the first time, and they were still in Galilee, even before this journey to Jerusalem. Each time he told them, he added an additional detail. The second time he added that he would be betrayed by somebody. The disciples, we read, were filled with grief. There's no rebuking of Jesus here, but it does say they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him. They really didn't want to know what this was about, and yet this was so central to what Jesus, uh, is, his mission is all about. On at least three occasions, spaced apart, Jesus told the 12 apostles plainly 
what would soon happen to him in Jerusalem. Jesus made several other references to this matter too, which I won't elaborate now. Now Luke wrote in that passage that we've read together that uh, it, the meaning was hidden from them. There's a lot more that could be said about this as to why it was hidden and uh, who caused this. Um, but essentially, um, they didn't want to face up to their own need for a saviour. They were hoping for a different type of Messiah, a different type of leader than the one God was providing for in Christ and the one that Christ was. And the root cause of this what was for them and still is stubborn, determined resistance to God by literally everyone, including those 12 apostles. They did not want a saviour of the manner that God provided in Jesus. And it's not just that they didn't like the idea and would prefer something else. They resisted that with a passion. They wanted a great leader who would overthrow the pagan Romans, restore Israel to its former glory and prosperity, bringing order and peace. And with them, as subordinate leaders of Christ, they were the 12, the ones he'd appointed, his associates and favourites. That's the kind of Messiah they longed for, not the way of the cross. No, definitely not. And they continued in this mindset up to the death of Jesus and beyond even until they encountered the risen Lord Jesus. Now, there's even more to consider here. They didn't mind at all that Jesus was their Lord, their leader, their master, and that he'd come to rescue them, to save them. That was pretty good. But did their sins really require the crucifixion of the lovely, only begotten Son of God? Surely not. Each of them would have thought, my sins aren't that bad, are they? They don't warrant such a punishment, do they? Perhaps I deserve a smack on my bottom or a time in the naughty corner or something like that, but not such a horrific, lethal punishment taken in my place by the pure and holy Son of God. Now, there are huge lessons for us here in this that we're considering. Number one, sin is that serious. The cost of our sins being forgiven is that high. Three, God loves us that much. Four, only God can rescue us. And finally, it needs God to open people's eyes to see the truth. And he does open people's eyes. But we must move on as we get to the next part of our text. There are two final incidents recorded as Jesus drew near his destination, Jerusalem. Firstly, uh, from Luke 18, verse 35, um, we have this uh, incident of Jesus restoring the sight of a blind beggar, whose name happens to be Bartimaeus. Despite the weight of the sins of the world on Jesus' shoulders, so to speak, and the cross looming ahead of him, Jesus had time for this poor man. Notice how different Jesus' uh, attitude is to that of the crowd. All the crowd wanted was for this nu nuisance to be quiet, to shut up. But Jesus stopped, called Bartimaeus, asked what he wanted, and then did it for him. A miraculous healing. Jesus had compassion on the man and responded to his faith. And notice the wonderful outcome we read in Luke 18, verse 43, uh, not, only from, uh, not only for Bartimaeus, but for the people around. Immediately, Bartimaeus received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. So positive. And all the more so when seen against the ominous dark clouds gathering over Jesus and his disciples at this time. Jesus has time for you and for me too. Nothing in the lives of people of faith is too insignificant for him. Now, the second incident uh, in the Jericho region, uh, it's mentioned only here in Luke's account, 
concerned a man named Zacchaeus, who was in some ways a huge contrast to this blind Bartimaeus. Zacchaeus had a high status. He was probably quite wealthy and secure, while Bartimaeus had the lowest status in society and was probably dirt poor, constantly dependent on the generosity of others. But in another way, these two were both alike. They were both marginalised by mainstream society, uh, Bartimaeus because he was a blind beggar, and Zacchaeus because he was a chief tax collector for the hated Roman authorities. Imagine how many friends he had. It's interesting that Luke puts these two incidents together in his account, and they're successive in his account. Of course, they did happen successively, that's why they're there, he wrote what happened. But it's an interesting combination of these, these two. Uh, they happened one after the other in the same locality. Uh, I think Luke wants us to learn something more about Jesus from this. Jesus is no respecter of persons. He deals with all, with rich and with poor, with those of high status, the mighty, and with those of no status, the lowly, and everything in between. What matters is faith, belief, trust in him. Let's hear Jesus' summary statement about his mission. It's in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, just after uh, the incident of uh, these two incidents. He said, the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. What does this mean for us? Do you think of yourself? Do I think of myself as in some significant way lost? really lost apart from Jesus' action? If so, take heart, because Jesus came for such people. But if you think you've got it all together, that you're in control and you don't need anything, um, well, then, and you don't need Jesus or his sacrifice, then Jesus is not for you. We each need humility. We re need to really see our situation, how tragic it is, how empty, how meaningless and how ominous is our future in view of our sins. When we really see these things, then wonder of wonders, Jesus came for just such people who are lost, just such people as us. And I hope that we see that that includes you and me. Okay, well now we come to the final section of our Bible reading, known as the parable of the ten miners. Miner is M-I-N-A. Now, a miner is a sum of money, it doesn't really matter how much, it's equivalent to about three months' wages for a typical worker back in those days, so it was quite some money. And in this parable, there are ten servants, although this, the focus is only on three. And each of these ten servants is entrusted with the same amount of money, one miner. And each servant is expected to trade with that money, while his master, who was heir to a kingdom, is away. And he's, while he's receiving the right to rule that kingdom. Their day of reckoning comes, reckoning for these uh, ten servants, it comes when the master returns, having received uh, the right to rule this kingdom, uh, and when he begins ruling. Now we're not left to wonder why Jesus told this parable at this particular time. We read in Luke chapter 19, verse 11, it says um, that he went on to tell them a parable, this parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. So Jesus is countering this idea that it's going to happen straight away and there's going to be quite a long wait. He was preparing his followers then and for us too for a period of time, who knows how long, when we need to be steadily working for him in his absence as we await his coming and his inauguration as king of the whole world. Now, of these three specific servants, two were commended and rewarded, the two who had acted wisely with the money entrusted to them, but the third servant had to face the king's anger. Luke 19, from verse 20, this other servant came and said, Sir, here is your miner. I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. 
Uh, his master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I might have collected it with interest? Now notice here that this servant, the third one, he had a negative view of his master, unlike the other two. He specifically says, he says, you're a hard man. You're taking out what you didn't sow and so on. He called him a hard, unfair, demanding man. And in his own mind, that excused his laziness. Uh, the master, in responding to him, doesn't accept this description of him, he, but he just requotes th that servant's words. And in fact, the master is not like that. Uh, he indicated that he would have been satisfied, at least to some degree, if the money had just been put in the bank so that it earned a bit of interest when he came back. But he, this servant hadn't even done that. The master said, uh, throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now to gnash one's teeth means to grind your teeth or to strike the teeth together, especially in rage or pain. It's certainly not nice. It's easy to grasp the meaning of this parable. Jesus is the man of noble birth that the parable began with. He's gone into a distant country. That is, he's gone into heaven in the presence of God, uh, the Father, from where he will return to take up his rightful inheritance, which is the whole world, and to reign as universal king, just like this fellow did in the parable. He came back to receive his kingship. And his servants in the parable... Well, that must be you and me to whom he's given the money to use in his service until he comes back. What is this minor and what did Jesus mean put this money to work? Well, to answer that adequately would take another sermon. But I'll leave the question with you. What do you think it means? He's given us the, this money and he's expecting us to use it until he returns and there's a day of accounting. But there's one final thing in our reading that comes at the end of that parable. Luke chapter 19 and verse 12. We read, uh, it told, told us at the beginning that as he was going into the distant country, uh, that um, there were some subjects who hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. And this is left hanging until the end of the story, right down in verse 27, when, the, when finally he settled accounts with his servants and he says, but those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Wow, what a dramatic finale and a dreadful fate for those ones. Is this gentle Jesus, meek and mild? Is this the same Jesus who loved the children and put his hands on them to bless them? Well, yes, it is. Of course, what we've read is a parable, a story, but its meaning is pretty obvious, isn't it? So, to sum up, um, the disciples, the apostles, and the people generally of that time, and probably ever since, have been looking for a different type of Messiah. Do we? Or do we see the true Messiah, the true Christ? <coughs> Number two, they didn't take sin seriously enough, including their own sin, or especially their own sin. Do we? Three, Jesus stops for the one person who calls for his help, and he helps him. He saves that poor man. For Jesus reaches rich and poor alike, high and low, and he saves those who trust in him. And finally, Jesus wants us to be at work for him as we wait for his coming kingdom. Now, Jesus is not what the world expects. Very different, actually. But he is the coming king of the whole world. It is his, he is the heir to it, and he will come. 
don't be among those who said, we don't want this man, Jesus, to be our king, and then you won't share their dreadful fate. Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Lord. He died for you and me, and he lives for you and me. Trust him. Believe in him. Love him. Worship him. Please join me in prayer. Wake us all up, Lord, so that we're ready for your coming again. You are our world's rightful king. To you, everything belongs. May we all be counted among your blessed people. In your name and for your sake we pray. Amen.